thank you everyone for um, for coming today and joining us. We're very, very excited about uh, today's program. Um, uh, it's going to be, I think, it's very, very interesting, and we couldn't come at a better time, as we've all experienced in these unprecedented times recently, um, how technology has enabled us to do what we do every single day, whether it's work or or teaching our kids from home or things like that. So I think that the, again, it just reinforces how important technology is in our world. You know, I've, I spent, you know, 30 plus years on Wall Street and then Georgetown and, and, and focused on technology and financial markets, et cetera. And I've seen, you know, <laughs> dating myself, I was around before the internet. I was around before mobile. I was around before some of these things. I think Silvio can, uh, can share that with me. And I've watched the adoption of those technologies and, um, <clears throat> Uh, and the challenge that a new, a new technology brings. So we're delighted to bring you today up part of the path forward. Um, today is about frictionless finance for enterprise. Um, and I think that this level set a few things, a few comments, you know, the future of assets are digital. And I say that coming from the stock market of 30 years and watching it be paper and then like, and physical trading to electronic trading to then digital. Um, but I think what's really important is, and as I said with some of the other earlier technologies, to ensure widespread adoption, we need a trusted technology. And I think that's critical, and I think that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today, because it's crucial for people who want to adopt it, businesses and organizations to adopt digital assets and securities, is that the infrastructure is trusted, it's secure, they feel comfortable with it. So we couldn't have two better companies than Algorand and Securitize, we're leading the edge of this conversation. Um, but before um, we move into our fireside chat, I did want to um, introduce uh, Silvio. And Silvio needs no introduction, which is a good thing, because if we, if I spent time going through his bio, we wouldn't have time for anything else today. Um, he is a renaissance man across all areas of technology and has been for many, many years. And uh, I think uh, Silvio, you're going to uh, share some thoughts and uh, some observations on CoChain today, correct? Yes, John, thank you very much uh, uh, for a very kind introduction and uh, welcome all of you uh, to this webinar. Uh, so first of all, let me tell you one thing. I'm very passionate uh, about you know, blockchains. In particular, I'm passionate about uh, the public permissionless blockchain because it enables uh, organizations, individuals, governments to transact uh, with efficiency, transparency and security with each other, both internally and with one another. And, uh, and, you know, the enterprise uh, can, uh, through a public blockchain, expand uh, its addressable market, increases revenue, generating new products, and so on and so forth. This being said, however, public blockchains are not uh, always well suited for organizations um, like, you know, finance, uh, banking, or governments uh, that uh, need to have a tighter control about who can access their data. And, um, and perhaps enough you know, regulatory problems prevent them to use you know, a, a, a public blockchain. And so they want to go a private blockchain. Well, I want to rest assured that we at Algorand, we want to give you the best public blockchain as well as the best uh, private blockchain there, uh, there can be. So let me tell you a little bit you know, what is our design for a core chain. And first of all, let's start with a, a very important question. So what is a co-chain? So a co-chain, first of all, is an independent chain. So if you run a co-chain, you run your own consensus algorithm unaided by anybody. It's a private chain, so allows you to shield the transaction from uh, um, the rest of the world. And um, so because you run your um, uh, somehow consensus algorithm, which algorithm should you run? Algorand. Well, why Algorand? Let me tell you, there are three main reasons that make it very suitable. So the first one is, is that it is scalable, secure, and distributed. You know, from a co-chain, from a private blockchain perspective, say scalability may not uh, somehow impress you very much because you say, well, I'm going to have uh, 10 validators in charge. Yes, maybe, but in this day of uh, cybersecurity attacks all over the place, aren't you better off running 100 validators rather than 10? or even a thousand rather than, ten, than a hundred. And so because uh, you make yourself more secure, and if you can do so without you know, slowing the block production, 
then why should you shouldn't you have you know um, more validators instead? So Algorand allows you to scale perfectly well. The second thing is that Algorand has uh, some uh, very nice tools that you may like to have, and uh, one of them is uh, our rather uh, layer one smart contract. Okay, so let me tell you what uh, um, a, a, a layer one uh, smart contract uh, is. So the one uh, uh, piece uh, that uh, um, uh, occasion that you may want to have, uh, uh, and the first one actually is this a smart contract that can actually can uh, execute in seconds without slowing down the blocks. And the third good reason is interoperability between co-chain. Interoperability between whom and whom? One, the co-chain and the main chain, so the algorithm main chain, the permissionless ones. And you say, why do I want, to, if I'm a co-chain, to interact with the main chain? Because, for instance, you want to sell an asset. And as everybody knows, an auction, you, you get more revenue, the larger is the number of bidders. So there are always more bidders in the rest of the world than inside your own co-chain. So to, you may have a reason to put uh, somehow your asset for sale on the main chain. And here it is, you parachuted, will provide you a 10 lanes super highway, super fast highway to bring your asset to the main chain sell it there at auction, and then super fast repatriate dollars, euros, algos, whatever you want, where, uh, uh, to the seller. All right, and a second form of uh, interoperability is uh, interoperability between two co-chains. So here is this picture, you have a blue co-chain that has an asset A, blue A, and a red co-chain that has an asset red A. And, uh, they want to exchange it. What do they do? First of all, they get the super highway to bring to themselves their, uh, their assets in Algorand. Once they are in Algorand, taking advantage of our legendary atomic swap that I just mentioned, they swap within second, in seconds, and after that, they super fast repatriate them to where uh, uh, to their respective co chain. And now D has become blue and goes to the blue uh, chain, and A has become red and goes to the red chain. So you may say, say at this point in, in time, you know, I really understand the uh, design of co chain, but uh, it looks a little bit familiar. Well, sure, a lot of people would like uh, uh, to be hubs. And Algorand is one, but you're going to find you know, um, uh, others as well. Well, let me tell you that uh, a hub is only as good as the infrastructure it offers, period. So, are all hubs created equal? I'll give you a hint, no. And so let me actually make the point by talking about uh, one particular type of hub airline hubs that we know very well by experience. In an airline hub, assume that you want to have, uh, oh, here you have, oh, I want to be a hub because uh, I have a great view. If you come over here, I'll show you great views. But in reality, we want a, a lot of infrastructure. We want mechanics to work on your plane. You want hangars where the mechanics can work on your planes. We want to have um, hotels for your crew um, uh, um, uh, to rest, uh, restaurants, and so on and so forth. So, therefore, I really believe that you know, um, 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 blockchains are exquisite technological products. There is no blockchain without technology. And uh, really, at Algorand, we really worked very, very hard to, <laughs> to give you the best technology in the permissionless, in the permission, and even more so in the synergy that we believe that there ought to be between permissionless and, uh, and, uh, and permission. So somehow, if you are an independent chain and you want to be an independent chain, by becoming a, a, a co-chain of Algorand, you retain full independence, you have the best uh, in, uh, in kind you know, consensus protocol, and actually you have uh, all ways to transact at a layer one with a very other um, um, co-chain. And what does mean layer one? Means at the very consensus level, 
not a layer two fragile, slow and expensive smart contract. But layer one means with an, an atomic swap, an auction, and um, 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 a collateralized loan can be the tokenization of entire building. It can happen within seconds and at a price of milli algo. That is really the, the efficiency that we can provide. So uh, that is all I have to say about Algorand coaching. Great. Um, look, thanks to uh, Silvio. So um, very informative. I really do appreciate the, the background. Um, I do want to point out that Silvio, it's clear he spends a lot of time in the classroom. I wasn't sure how he was going to do this without a whiteboard, but he managed <laughs> to make his own whiteboard by uh, with all those flashcards. So uh, it just proves to say you can take the professor out of the classroom, but you cannot take the classroom out of the classroom. <laughs> um, we're going to turn now to our fireside chat, and I'm really delighted uh, to, to be able to um, to to chat with uh, these two individuals who I think are, um, uh, there's nobody better to help us understand um, how to move forward and how we should collectively move forward in this space. Um, so from, uh, we have Steve, CEO of Algorand, and Carlos, who is the founder and co-CEO of Securitize. And we're going to, um, uh, there they are, starting to come on board. We're, uh, we're gonna walk through a, a series of questions and, and points, et cetera, and um, uh, we'll save some time at the end for questions as well. Now. Gentlemen, we have a very diverse audience here today, and I would love you guys to both start off and talk a little bit about yourselves and, and your firms a little bit. Um, we heard a little bit from about the algorithm from, from Silvio, but talk a little about your firms and yourselves. And then the first question I want you to kind of dive into or approach is, what would you say to someone um, at an enterprise level company who is looking to use digital securities what questions should they be asking people like you in order to go on this path because um all new technologies can be confusing and you know you, you mentioned crypto or bitcoin this it, people conflate these things etc and this is a great opportunity for um you know uh, for you to kind of level set so i'll kick it off with you carlos and steve you know quick background and then if you guys could address that first question we can go from there Sure. Um, I'm Carlos Domingo. I'm the co-founder and, and CEO of Securitize. And uh, thanks, uh, John, Silvia, and Steve for, for setting up the, the webinar with us. Um, our company has been around since 2017, and we've been one of the pioneers in the space of uh, you know security tokens or digital securities, which is basically a way to digitize the process of issuing, managing, and trading uh, securities uh, and using uh, blockchain technology. I'm, I'm Steve Kokino, some uh, CEO of Algorand, and uh, you know, I guess you know, at Algorand, we really feel that um, so there's some foundational problems that need to be solved for um, larger scale deployments and larger scale applications and, and financial products to be deployed on the blockchain. Um, and you know, in Algorand, I guess the way we've really approached that is um, two ways. One. Uh, really developing foundational technology that's scalable, secure, and decentralized, um, whether that's in a private or a public setting. Um, and you know, our co-chains is our answer to uh, permissioned chains that people may want to create. And then the second is by creating a, a suite of, of tools in layer one uh, that enable for rapid, simple creation of, of um, uh, digital assets, um, securities, uh, other forms of digital assets, and doing that in a very flexible way, um, but in a way that uh, doesn't require uh, complicated smart contracts and doesn't require uh, some of the, the sort of risks and formal verification uh, that are necessary in some of the other first generation platforms. So we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, I, I know, but um, uh, really excited to be here. And, and thanks, John, for, uh, for taking the time to do this with us. Oh, my pleasure, believe me. Um, so, you know, where, where does someone start? If you're at enterprise level, you know, large company, large organization, um, infrastructure, looking at, um, you know, financial services of the other industry, what's the first question that people should ask? So uh, let me take this uh, from, from our perspective, what have we seen in, in the industry? So as most companies on the blockchain space, we started in 2017 using the public Ethereum blockchain. And that was kind of like the reference, uh, you know, companies like Algorand were not around and uh, that's where the industry started. And, and then the first projects we did, you know, they were all on the public Ethereum blockchain and we didn't actually have any problem doing things there for, for a number of reasons. First, you know, it was less congested. Uh, second, um, it was, uh, you know, cheaper to transact. 
um, you know, already had you know a lot of the tools and the ecosystem that was required. And and lastly, most of our initial customers were you know small alternative asset issuers um, that were kind of comfortable with the with the public blockchain, and they actually didn't perceive an issue on on issuing the securities there. Now, as as the industry evolved, and we started getting more uh, interest from institutional uh, you know issuers or institutional uh, you know broker dealers, uh, traders, etc. You know, there was a number of questions that started coming up about, you know, whether they could actually use or not the public blockchain. And just to make a similar with another industry, this is very, very similar to what happened on the cloud computing industry. So in when AWS from Amazon started, um, at the time I was actually the CEO of a, a small software company in, in Seattle. So I kind of knew the, the, the people that were promoting AWS. And for me as the CEO of a startup, being able to you know get rid of all our hardware and all our storage and everything and put it on the cloud was was great and I felt like wow this is uh, you know the perfect tool for uh, for companies to scale and then you know shortly after I actually moved to a Fortune 500 company I became the head of R&D for a company called Telefonica which is a very large uh, telecommunications company and I was naive enough at the beginning to think oh well let's propose to move people to the cloud because you know companies like Telefonica have a lot of infrastructure that they could save a lot of money and then when they start asking questions about like, you know, what is the connectivity to the data center? What is the data center located? Uh, you know, what is the SLA that Amazon is offering uh, for corporations? So what is the data retention policy if we want to delete something? Uh, what is the security procedures? And, you know, we could not answer those questions. AWS didn't have any of those things. So what happened is those corporations, they created, you know, uh, private clouds. And it's very similar to what's happening in the industry now. The problem with the private cloud is you mm -hmm. only leverage to some extent the cloud technology because it doesn't scale and it doesn't have the elasticity uh, and the, the amount of resources on demand that you can get on the public cloud. And then they started doing hybrid clouds, which were kind of like a mix of things where you keep some data on your private cloud and some data on the public cloud and they're connected. And then you can, you know, when you have a run of resources on the public cloud, you can do it on the, uh, on the private cloud, you can do it on the public cloud, etc. So this reminds me a lot to what's happening on the blockchain industry. Today, if you approach a large financial institution, they're going to have a lot of questions about public blockchains uh, that we don't have answers yet. Uh, and uh, so one is, uh, you know, who is running that? What is the governance model? What's going to happen with forks? Uh, what about the pseudonymity of the data that is there? Uh, how do you control access control between the different participants? Um, what is the cost of the transaction? How does it change over time? So I can predict more or less how much it's going to cost, uh, et cetera. And the answer so far in the industry has been, you know, permission-based blockchains, which then create all sort of other problems, uh, because then you know you have to create governance from scratch. It's not necessarily as secure and as decentralized. Um, you know, you have to pick one particular technology and then you create a silo that's completely isolated for all the things. So I think that the approach that Algorand is taking, and Steve will talk more about it, is probably an answer to these things of you know combining the the advantages of a permission-based blockchain that institutions want with the security and the underlying capabilities for public blockchain, which is, I believe, is the future, right? Once it is ready for prime time. Great. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of, I mean, for sure, how we think about it as well. And and um, I would say that you know, just taking a step back, um, there are certainly regulatory issues, privacy issues. Um, there's many different reasons, uh, I think, why um, private chains, you know, may be something that people feel they need to do. Um, our take is that uh, we shouldn't sort of need to decide on those those uh, kind of business choices. At the same time, I think if we take a look at the internet or take a look at uh, cloud computing, like you brought up, Carlos, uh, it definitely is the case that public networks tend to win out in the end uh, and provide a lot of utility out there. And so if you look at Algorand Cochains, really it's, you know, the first architecture that allows people to deploy uh, a permission chain um, if they feel they have reasons to do that, but but doesn't preclude uh, the possibility of, of transacting on the public network um, at any time. And it's not a requirement to do so, um, but being able to use the public network to transact or use the public network as a transit um, to send um, assets to, to, to other private chains. And we think that interoperability in general is a very important um, area that um, uh, people are going to need more of, not less. And it's starting out in a way that, that doesn't cause big technical hurdles uh, in terms of when people do decide that they're they're ready to go to the public network, we think as so. well. No, I think I think you both have a great point. Interoperability. So, from my experience in the finance, in, in the stock market in Wall Street, is that it's a combination, right? Nasdaq, when the traders are trading stocks on Nasdaq New York Stock Exchange, they're not on the internet, right? They're on a private 
network. But when the orders are coming in, whether it's individuals to fidelity, fidelity to this, those are also, it's a combination of public and private. It's a combination of internet and, and private networks. It's a, it's a combination of public cloud and private cloud. So um, I do think that interoperability and the flexibility to combine those two is really, really critical. Um, uh, so why do you think, I mean, I look, I'm excited about it and, and have been um, uh, since I started really focusing on blockchain uh, after I, I left, uh, uh, even at NASDAQ, uh, toward the end of my career there, I was looking at the blockchain. Why do you think financial services are so excited about, um, and th that industry is so excited about uh, this moving forward in this way? So if you think about what has happened in the markets the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, is the the public markets have been shrinking and the private markets have been growing, right? Uh, and the public markets, to some extent, are, uh, you know, efficiently digitized. They might not be natively digitized. They might be issued with tracking beneficial owners or settlement times and things like that. But the perception for most people is that, you know, I can go to Robinhood and I can buy, you know, Apple shares or options or whatever I want. And it's, it's digital, it's a good user experience, it's instant, uh, et cetera. Now, private markets, which are much bigger and growing faster, are nothing like that, are actually very poorly digitized, if, if digitized at all. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, they're much more complex to digitize because they're more fragmented, more different use cases, and a lot of more like participants that, you know, disparate participants from different institutions that need to collaborate uh, against. So I think that the, the excitement about blockchain for financial services, it comes from the excitement about digitization. Uh, because they realize that being digital uh, is actually an advantage to provide, you know, faster settlement times that, you know, you know, free money for more trading, as it actually happened uh, on, on the public stock market as well, it is the efficiency, the, you know, better capital formation because you can reach out to more investors, you can facilitate the investment process, um, you can enable liquidity, which is, you know, notoriously complicated for private securities because they have more restrictions, uh, et cetera. So I think the excitement comes not necessarily from blockchain itself, but it comes from digitization. It just happens to so that blockchain is a particularly good platform to provide that digitization that is needed in private markets. Yeah, I think you know if you take a if you take a look at the past twenty years, you know the internet has you know really changed the way information flows around the world. Uh, it's changed the way people communicate and consume media and shop. Um, if you look at the financial systems. Um, you know, I, I think really, you know, kind of blockchain and blockchain tools and a lot of the, the platforms being built now, you know, ultimately serve as an underpinning for, um, you know, not only uh, modernizing the system, but also changing the way uh, people uh, communicate value to each other. Uh, and one of the things to think about is, while for sure um, we have, you know, have had a lot better user experiences in terms of the financial system here in the US. If you think about the way a lot of companies transact today, it's a much more global world. People have vendors that are outside of, of their own countries. Things are being produced inter internationally. So the idea that um, commerce is happening in a decentralized way already, but neither the financial or legal systems um, really are designed in order to handle uh, transactions that are cross jurisdiction. I think one of the, the big benefits of um, blockchain platforms is that they enable, or really decentralized blockchains, uh, public blockchains, is that they enable a way um, for people to leverage, you know, algorithms and the underlying platform to establish trust in those relationships. Um, and I think that that's what's attracted new people into those platforms, uh, but especially uh, could be from places where, um, you know, people are underserved in their markets and whatnot. So I, I think it's it's both a combination of, of sort of modernizing and, and kind of rethinking the systems um, that exist where a lot of legacy infrastructure is built up. But secondly, you know, also thinking about how taking advantage of new markets and, you know, geographies that may have been complicated to navigate uh, in kind of a legacy world as well. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. But I think definitely if, you know, the next 20 years, um, we see the, the a similar level of, of innovation in finance that the last 20 years has brought us, um, you know, around communications and other areas. I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, I, you both approached an issue I want to, uh, example I want to talk about uh, from different angles, and I, I think it's perfect. Um, when I first came to this business, to, to settle a stock trade, it took five business days, T plus five. Then they moved to T plus three, right? When I right when I started my career, and then recently T plus two. There's no reason except the legacy systems that there's not T plus zero. And the idea was not efficiency and effectiveness, or that was the idea at first. Let we should use technology. They did not realize the unintended benefits 
of reducing that time, which was eliminating uncertainty, reducing risk. So if you're a buyer and you're a seller and you get those assets you want two days earlier, three days earlier, instantaneously, you're willing to recommit that capital, that liquidity that you mentioned, Carlos, back into the marketplace. So it was a way to, it, the unintended benefit was massive reduction in risk in the system by utilizing technology to shorten settlement times and speed up the transactions of asset exchange of assets. And, um, uh, and, and I do think that, that Steve, you point out, you know, the legacy systems, the regulatory processes, they're just not caught up there yet. So, um, but do you, this is, um, you know, I, I our, our, do our, in your conversations with, with organizations and systems and companies, et cetera, are they understanding that it's not just, hey, this is a great new technology, but it is about reducing overall risk in the system? I think they understand, but precisely because the system is risky and if you get things wrong, uh, you know, something very bad can happen. I think this is why this technology is going to is going to take it and it's taking actually longer to be adopted. They're like, you know, I'm a technologist, I've been doing technology all my career and there is a saying technology that every new technology always gets adopted faster, right? And you get to see this presentation saying, oh, first the radio took 50 years and then TV 30 and then the internet 20 and then mobiles 10 and then the people think of oh, whatever comes next is going to be adopted faster. but you know, if you think about other industries that have been digitized, like let's say music, look, if, if your music streaming system doesn't work very well, which I remember Spotify at the beginning didn't work very well, and you don't get your favorite song streamed while you're running, look, nothing happens, right? But, you know, if you actually made a mistake and, and you lose your money or, or if you purchase the wrong security and or settlement actually doesn't get done properly and things like that, you know, the consequences for the financial system are very big. And I think this is why these technologies will take longer to be adopted uh, and also because they're highly regulated right so you have to come have to bring the regulators alongside them uh, and, and make them understand that this is not necessarily more risky but it's actually less risky uh, and better and i still don't think they they are there right and i think the other complication of here is that you know with other technologies you can go to one entity and sell them and convince them to use it and if they adopt it, then you move forward the industry. Here is something that you need to convince a lot of people to adopt it because the fundamental benefit of you know distributed ledger technology and blockchain is precisely that people can a bunch of different entities that you know interact with each other can collaborate with the same platform. And that means that you have to actually convince all of them to actually start doing something. Otherwise, you lose part of the value that you bring into the table. I'll just say, like, I, to kind of add on to that, um, I also think you know there is a technology problem that hasn't helped uh, matters in in the blockchain world at least at the beginning. Uh, I think one of the things is that is definitely a problem is both from a scalability and a security standpoint. Um, you know, first generation blockchains are very interesting and innovative. Um, but not necessarily fit for the purpose of you know larger scale either asset value or users. And I think definitely um, Algorand and the science behind it that that Silvio created um, is an attempt to kind of put the right uh, infrastructure in place. Um, and you can kind of think about it as the you know when we started getting high speed bandwidth on the internet uh, that we could rely on versus dial up modems. But there's a, a second problem that I think's out there is that uh, the way that sort of initial smart contract platforms um, which were very innovative and gave the real flexibility to program money and create you know, new types of financial instruments um, or um, brought forward um, was to be Turing complete, i.e. was to be very flexible. And I think that there's, there's sort of two issues that come up there. A, people need to learn entirely new technologies. And then B, um, in those types of systems, the consequences of a particular application are very difficult to determine um, because of that flexibility. And so, you know, I think one of the things that, that Algorand has really looked at doing is um, taking a different approach where we have a more restrictive set of, of activities people can do. However, you know, they take the safety and security of the protocol and they're designed um, purposefully around, you know, the types of activities that, that people need when they're creating assets, creating transactions, and, uh, you know, ultimately um, need to be able to, 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 you know, control access around them. Um, rather than having it be a boundless set of conditions. And so I think definitely understanding um, the needs of uh, people who are, are issuing financial assets is something that we've thought through. And I, I know you guys have as well at, at Securitize, Carlos. John, I want to give another example of what you precisely asked about reducing risks. Right? So traditionally, 
financial services have reduced risk by adding intermediaries, right? That, that's the way you ensure that things actually work, right? So if you issue a bond and you're, let's say, a large corporation issuing a bond on IBM or an Apple or whatever, um, you know, you, you, once you agree on what you want to issue and who's going to buy it, then you basically give it to an, an issuing and paying agent who is the person, the entity, that, let's say, that has an account with the central depository where they actually register the, the bond issuance. And if you're a broker dealer and you give it to an investor, then you're going to go, the investor is going to use a custodian, which will have another account with the same central depository where they actually will, you know, finally entertain the, the, you know, the, the security with the cash, right? And that's how the system works is by adding layers of intermediaries that guarantee that, that those steps are done properly. And, and what this technology does, does is actually provides the same level uh, of security that things happen without intermediaries. So Silvio mentioned about atomic swaps. That's a, that's a great example of how uh, in the world of securities, uh, you can eliminate intermediaries because you're an issuer, you can represent the security on the blockchain uh, as a token. And that uh, you know token actually has a number of rules about that govern the, the security, the compliance, the rules, et cetera. And another person who wants to buy that has another token that represents cash as in a stable coin or whatever on the same blockchain. And then the, the cryptographic nature of the blockchain and the atomic swaps allow you to swap the two things and in real time kind of verify that the transaction is legal as well from a compliance perspective. Uh, and that basically eliminates everybody that today makes financial systems uh, work. It reduces settlement time, it reduces the cost, uh, and, and to, in some sense, it's even more secure because it's you know secure by mathematics, right? So, and that's I think that's what is hard for people to understand because people trust other people; they don't trust software, right? So, so it's a big leap of faith in, in terms of time, something trusting something that not everybody understands. Uh, that's a perfect segue to the next part of the questions I want to talk to you about, which is again adoption of a new technology will absolutely fundamentally change an industry and i will pick one that i think uh, that, uh, that i think is very interesting because it gets to the point you just mentioned which is can we do trusting in new technology etc and how challenging it is for certain certain segments of the, of the of different industries so my father's 90 years old he looks at banking as a social event he wants to go to the bank this is pre-covid he likes to go into the bank and see the people and talk to the people and they say, hey, Colonel Jacobs, how you doing? And he says, how are you doing? And he chats. When I help him on errands, it's four hours. Stuff I could do in like 12 minutes online. I am 60, 61, so I'm the next generation. I know where my bank is. I go there once in a great while when I need to get something notarized or something else, but rarely ever do I do it. My three kids are in their 20s. And they think that this is a bank, right? They don't know where the bank is, but they do everything with uh, banking apps that are mobile and things like that. So it's interesting. We, I, I, my father was, um, as I said, military, and then you know worked for the government. And I, I, we grew up all using a credit union, and then my kids all had credit union accounts, and they've all left because they couldn't provide mobile, they couldn't provide payments, they couldn't provide those technologies. So what we're seeing is. Um, generations that want to work on and live on technology just they, if they're not satisfied by the, the, the incumbents in the space they're either going to adapt or die and so i want to that's the question i want you guys to talk about is how hard is it when you are in an industry that has to deal with the 90 year old and the 25 year old and you're trying to use uh, apply technology you can be the small in in, on the security side, you can be the small Robin Hoods, nimble, fast, you know, technology driven. You can be the large, you know, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, but the people in the middle are kind of stuck, uh, not being able to do move as quick and move as fast, et cetera. So if you could just talk about the challenges of of converting your model in, in this world. So I, I think that um oh sorry Carlos, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll take it. I was just gonna say, I mean I I think that um you know, user experiences need to improve uh, kind of across the board. Um, and I think if you look today, just because my kids are busy making TikToks uh, in my house right now, it doesn't mean that none of us can figure out how to use our phones uh, or use it for productive things. And so I, I think definitely, um, you know, generationally people, you know, use things for different use cases. What, what I think is interesting kind of in this domain is I think younger people definitely have a desire um, for experiences 
um, that are very seamless, um, not only you know in their physical lives and the way they travel, uh, but also in the way they transact financially. I think there's also a growing desire to be able to uh, understand what people are investing in. Uh, it seems to be a lot of interest in you know owning a piece of the Empire State Building versus owning part of a REIT that's and buying it through a fund manager and something else where there's multiple layers of indirection or multiple layers of, of kind of management through there. And so I, I think one of the, you know, we brought up the atomic swap idea, um, you know, the idea that your money could be held on chain, that you could swap that for equities in a single transaction, that you have one place that you can do that. And then you also end up with, with some with more fundamental control and visibility into, you know, how your money is being managed and what those assets are think is uh, is a very compelling one but you know the other portion part is uh, the need to be better user experiences um, for sure because I think uh, you know when I turn on Netflix I'm not like you know pumping my fist that Amazon Web Services is really great I'm just uh, turning it on to watch a TV show and I think that that um, right now there's been a lot of focus in the market around you know different blockchain technologies um, whereas I think really what excites us is that you know we're starting to see people think about you know, how do we handle regulatory requirements? How do we use a platform like Securitize or like Algorand? But how do we ultimately bring that application um, into the market in a way that uh, is very seamless for end users so they don't need to understand that the technology is different. They can just understand that the end result is um, something that they're more comfortable investing in and using long term. And um, I think that that's, that's really what's needed. And simple experiences benefit everyone, regardless of what generation you're in. So what, what, John, what you ask is actually a very well-known uh, problem in, uh, in innovation. Uh, it's, uh, it was kind of uh, stated by Clayton Christensen, a Harvard professor, which unfortunately passed away very recently. Uh, he wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma that basically exactly describes what you have just said, but in the context of other industries, which is typically the incumbent. It is already making money by serving the market, right? And then Typically, what they want to do is to make more money from their existing customers, and they don't realize there's other customers that at the beginning, they might be happier with, you know, a less, a, a lower quality service if you want, but uh, but that is a different one that, you know, allows them to do what they want at a cheaper, uh, a faster price. And that eventually, they have this dilemma about, you know, what should I do? Should I continue serving my existing base or should I move into a new base, which is naturally going to, you know, uh, lead to lo lower fees and, you know, a lower, uh, you know, margins and things like that. And, and that's why most large corporations end up not innovating because they are trapped into the innovator's dilemma and they continue focusing on what they've been doing so far. And most of the executives in those companies actually been rewarded for that, not being rewarded for, you know, doing something new. Uh, so, so the answer to that is that first, you have to first, you know, within those organizations, I think you need to separate. It doesn't mean that they should just shut down all the uh, you know, branches and stop serving your father. But at the same time, they have to have like maybe a second brand or a different team or uh, you know, a different value proposition that caters, let's say, millennials and younger people that they are looking for something else. And eventually that becomes the, uh, the main thing. And this, this kind of duality is very hard to deal uh, with larger corporations because typically one business cannibalizes the other. I and mean, you can see now that you know, TD Ameritrade charges for uh, you know, trading stocks and Robinhood is doing it for free because they have a different business model. And that, duality is difficult to deal uh, at a large corporation, but the answer is actually to do it separated. So not necessarily stop serving your father and shut down all the branches, but you know, reduce that over time while you create a second brand or a second uh, value proposition for, for the newer generations that are looking for something different. Sure, I, I think that's, I, 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 that's exactly right. The other, you mentioned large corporations or established business enterprises, et cetera. The other piece is if you're in a regulated industry, the regulatory environment doesn't let you change and adapt, right? So one of the things I've used in my in, in time I teach a class or, or lecture is a rule that was been around since the first technology when they invented the wheel, right? We had the wheel before we had and the car before we had traffic laws. Technology always moves faster than policy and regulation. It has to. You invent something, you start doing things with it versus what are the guidelines and guideposts, et cetera. So what in your experience has been um, you know, have you worked with a lot of regulated industries? Do you see special challenges there with the industries that are more regulated and working with the regulators and policymakers, or are they because many of them have seen 
internet, mobile, all these other cloud, all these new things come along, understand they should not be afraid of this, they just need to understand it. So talk about the regulated industry aspect of to, to trying to develop to deliver new enterprise solutions. So we are um, uh, we have a regulated entity in the U.S. Uh, we are a registered transfer agent with the with the SEC, um, and so far it's been okay. So we've been having discussions with the regulator, and we explain them what we do, and you know sometimes they understand it, sometimes not, but eventually they get it. And uh, you know as far as we follow the law and we don't break any laws, which we don't do, um, I think they they are okay with it. Um, of course, there is certain aspects of the regulation that you know don't necessarily fit. Um, what we do because they are designed for people operating in a different way. I'll just give you a very simple example. If you're a registered transfer agent, you have to take the fingerprints of some of the employees that are taking, you know, share certificates. We obviously don't have share certificates because we operate 100% digitally. So, you know, what do we do? Do we go and complain to the regulator saying, no, you have to change the law because, you know, share certificates are digital. We don't touch them and we don't want to give our fingerprints to, to you guys or, or we do what we did, which is okay, fine. We'll give you the fingerprints, we get the license, and then we continue working with the regulators to help them understand that in specific cases like ours, we actually don't touch share certificates and maybe, you know, the type of things they need to ask us, which they already do as well, is a different one. Like you need to put your software on escrow in case something happens or you need to have backup copies and stuff mm -hmm. like that. that uh, it's more the, uh, Purpose, right? But you know, these are regulated into the industries, whether we like it or not. And going against the regulators is not going to help anybody, or doing things illegal is not going to help anybody. So we need to find ways to, you know, either work within the regulators or provide, you know, sandbox environments where you can try new things and be exempt from, uh, you know, following regulations for a period of time or no action letters and things like that that allow, you know, companies like ours or like Algorand to to show the regulators that you know there are different ways of doing things than what is covered today by existing regulations. Steve, your thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I guess a couple, couple of different things. I, I think one um, for you know anybody who's sort of uh, trying to think about you know what technology platforms and you know providers to use in a space like this. Uh, I think making sure that you know a platform like Algorand has uh, a partner like Securitize that's been building um, in, in its community is important. I think everyone needs to con contemplate the regulatory obligations they have. Um, if they're going to, depending on what form of digital asset uh, they're going to be uh, issuing and what jurisdiction they may, may be issuing it in. Um, I think the second, though, just, you know, as, as kind of a technology company on our side, I also think it's really important um, that everyone really think carefully about the platform and the foundational elements, uh, the consensus protocol, the blockchain itself. Um, does it have the right tools that they need to get their work done easily? Uh, is it easy to, to build on? Um, but even beyond that, you know, at a fundamental level, uh, is it secure? Is it scalable? Uh, is it decentralized? Um, how do the, the items work? Uh, you know, I think a lot of these assets will live a long life, um, whether it's a national currency or whether it's a, you know an equity um, representing a, you know a, a large company. And uh, I think everyone really needs to think about that. So that is, these are kind of tends to be decisions that get made every once in a while um, on the kind of horizon of decades or longer. And so I, I just think um, as people look at it, they certainly have to manage their regulatory obligations. And I think, you know, a platform like Algorand, one of the nice thing is things that one, you know, our tooling itself allows people uh, to very, you know, simply put the right hooks in place uh, to manage regulatory obligations. Um, Securitize obviously um, is, has a big role in, in helping with that, um, as do, you know, other folks that are looking at things like uh, AML real time and, and using data analysis. Um, we recently announced a partnership with Chainalysis as an example there. So I, I think that there's a lot of different building blocks that are needed, um, but that also, you know, I think it's been sort of under discussed in some uh, some cases what sort of the underlying technology brings to the table and make sure that it's suitable uh, and secure and can actually scale uh, to some of these larger applications that people are bringing because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to change uh, once you roll these things out. I think that's the only thing on, on the regulatory side is that what, what we as an industry need to make an effort to communicate to the regulators is that, you know, this technology actually brings transparency to markets, uh, which is something that they lack today uh, in, in certain markets. And as you said, it brings efficiency, it reduces risks, it accelerates uh, freeing capital, et cetera. And that is something a regulator will want to do, right? You want to make sure that, you know, the laws are being enforced. And these smart contracts, actually, they do programmatically enforce rules. Uh, and then you can actually trace exactly what happens because you have an immutable ledger underneath where you're 
you know, tracing every single thing that happens. And if you think about what happens to the on private markets, I, I bet that regulators probably don't know most of what happens there because it's all based on exemptions, you know, uh, documents is there too big to track one by one, et cetera. But, you know, every time, you know, regulator has asked us to produce records of whatever we've done, it's just click a button and then you produce it and, and they can mm-hmm. actually have the evidence about why, you know, those securities changed hand or how many they were issued and that not, not more than the number of authorized securities were issued and things like that. They can actually see it and they can validate it. And this, from a regulatory perspective, should be great, right? Because it gives them transparency uh, about uh, what we do. So. Yeah, technology should lead to transparency, and that should be the regulator's friend. Yep. So I want to remind the audience that um, please put questions into the chat function. We do have um, a bunch of questions, and I'm going to actually switch and start asking some of those questions now. So this is the first question came, that came in from our audience. Do you see a co-chain tokenization effort in play for asset-backed securitization, ABS, for Algorand Securitize, similar to Symbiont Vanguard? e.g. moving legacy securities onto a secure, scalable, decentralized blockchain platform that can seamlessly connect private and public markets? It's a very long question. <laughs> it is a long question. It's two questions. But... <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want to answer that? Uh, I can tell you, like, first, the Symbian Bangor, uh, you know, release they did recently, I think it's great, and it's, it's one of the you know, good use cases, right? Asset-backed securities, um, you know, require transparency, require that you, you're able to trace the assets that are underneath the, the, the security you're issuing. Those securities are private securities, so you have to for, enforce uh, regulations, et cetera. So I definitely think that that's a great um, use case and an example, and certainly something that is 100% doable uh, on the coaching architecture that, uh, you know, Sylvia presented early on, because you can then, you know, transact the assets uh, in the coaching, but at the same time have the security on the layer one, with smart contract atomic swaps, uh, et cetera, for, for transacting. Yeah, and I, I guess the, you know, uh, what I would say is it definitely, um, you know, securitization of assets or in, in representing that in digital form is something that we see as, uh, as you know, a big opportunity. Um, we've already started to see some of that uh, going on on Algorand and um, expect to see more. So. I think definitely um, it's you know uh, an interesting opportunity, uh, and I think in some cases it will be existing assets that people want to bring on, which I think is more of, of the model that was described. Uh, I also think what we've started to see are you know kind of new types of financial products and assets that are regulated and people bring securities on. Um, I can give a, a example that um, was announced yesterday, um, covered in Bloomberg, which is um, Republic, which is a um, crowdfunding platform. They have a Reg A plus security token that they've issued in, in the U.S. Um, and uh, they will be paying out dividends using USDC, which is a, a stable coin uh, that's also um, being issued on Algorand, uh, among other places. And so I think what you're starting and what um, effectively Republic is doing is actually offering a share in equities kind of across a pool of, of investments that they're making, um, but making that open to anyone, including uh, retail investors and you know a, a different audience than usual. So I think we may see things kind of along the lines of what Simeon is doing, and we think that there's exciting opportunity there. We also think there's exciting opportunities um, to tokenize securities and digital assets um, in ways that are sort of represent different and new opportunities, and perhaps bring a new audience in that wouldn't have had access to those um, those securities in the first place. Interesting. So, yeah, one of the interesting examples, that, and this goes back to some of your earliest comments, Carlos, that I think are, are really um, uh, right pertinent to this question, which is, so I think about equity stocks. Um, I know that NASDAQ has built a private market that for private companies on the blockchain to manage the transactions. This is a low transaction um, marketplace where founders and angel investors, et cetera, may own shares, they want to step out. The company's not ready to go public, trying not to go public. The rules you know, have changed so companies can stay private longer. So companies are staying private, and they, but they still need occasionally an investor or a, a founder may need to liquidate some of their shares, et cetera. And this is a perfect application for blockchain. But what's interesting is if you think about it, when those companies go public, Right now, they'd be forced to go back to a non-digitized security, but um, I know DTC is working hard on it. So the way sometimes you know the, the 
the back end way sometimes of uh, of dealing with a big legacy system is to nibble around the edges, right? Bring in, you know, start at one end and work your way to it, as opposed to trying to take all the stocks that are public in this country, digitize them all at once, and, and so on. But um, yeah, so it's uh, you definitely see that everywhere everywhere you, you look, opportunities to convert legacy securities into digital assets. I, I think that you know I was hearing the other day a podcast uh, that someone from State Street did that he explain very well that so the Nasdaq is um, is an electronic trading system right but it's not natively digital so it is electronic in the sense that you know uh, you use technology to trade but it's not native digital and it you know even though the perception is that it runs very efficiently it actually does but it also has a lot of a bunch of other problems behind the scenes that people don't realize like you don't know who beneficial owners are so every time someone wants to do a proxy vote or you know pay a dividend they have to go through a lot of hoops and intermediaries to figure out who they need to pay and you know dividends take you know or 10 days to arrive after the company has actually disbursed the money, which is this money that is sitting on a transfer agent account, you know, accruing interest for the transfer agent instead of being in the hands of investors. So you can then, you know, reinvest it. And there's a lot of inefficiencies that people don't realize, but because there's so much infrastructure, it's also so difficult to displace. So I don't think that this is the right place to start. I think the private markets are easier to start uh, because they have less infrastructure around. Uh, agreed. And, and the other thing to note is inefficiency I've learned a long time ago, inefficiency means making money for certain people, people, for, firms, organizations step into those inefficiencies <laughs> and they act as that intermediary and they make a fortune. So their best, best in interest is to prolong that inefficiency as long as possible. They prefer not to have a technology or market solution. They prefer to, yeah, come to me, I'll take care of you and I'll just take a little piece. But uh, anyway. I think Steve, also though, it's, it's, it's changing um, and we're seeing some really interesting work going on. And I can give a, a concrete example for everyone here, uh, which is um, World Chess Organization has um, several hundred million fans, uh, you know, out around the world. Um, hundreds of millions play chess online every day, and and they have obviously a, a in-person championship with masters. Um, they uh, are in the process of doing an IPO on the London Stock Exchange, um, but also wanted to be able to offer their equity to. Um, you know, fans that were outside of the UK or didn't have ready access to um, kind of the traditional Western financial systems. And so what they ended up doing was a you know, hybrid offering where they offered a security token uh, on Algorand and and, uh, and then ultimately uh, are doing an IPO on the London Stock Exchange in a traditional way. And that doesn't change their regulatory obligations or anything else, but it does open that to um, a new audience out there. And I think those are the things we're going to start to see more of um, in the short term. You start to see these hybridized instruments, um, you know, as a as a route to kind of longer term um, being able to, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, find kind of the right way, uh, the right way forward, and have you know kind of pure digital instruments. I think we might. Did we lose John? Yeah, John, did we lose you? I know that his uh, his internet was iffy this morning. I'm going to bring up a couple more questions, guys, that we're getting from the audience. So the second question, uh, if you want a DVP on Algorand, I understand Securitize can provide the D instrument token. When, how do you plan to introduce real money on chain, euros, pounds, et cetera, the P part of that instrument token? Um, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, sure, maybe, Car Carlos, why don't I take the first part of that, and then I think you can uh, you know, the second part, if that's all right. Sure, sure, go ahead. Um, so a, a couple of different things. I, I think there's uh, obviously, you know, by real money, I, I think you can you can kind of take that in different ways. It could be digital fiat, uh, could be stable coins. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, that's still being kind of um, figured out. Uh, I'll give a few examples of, um, you know, money that's coming, you know, to Algorand or on Algorand today. Uh, so one example is USDC, which is, um, uh, co-managed by um, Circle and Coinbase. Uh, it's one, you know, fully collateralized stable coin. So every dollar there is backed by a US dollar. Um, and they've done a lot of work with regulatory authorities. Um, that's that's one example of a stable coin um, that's backed by fiat and, and fully collateralized. Um, there's other examples. Monarium uh, is a project uh, deploying an Algorand. Um, they are based in Europe. So we'll start with um, European currencies, uh, they are regulated e-money, so that is actually being done with the European regulators and will be considered um, digital fiat, uh, so slightly different than, than kind of a third party issuing a, an asset fact um, token. And then, you know, the third is we're seeing definite uh, progress around central bank digital currencies. 
Um, the Marshall Islands uh, recently announced they're going to be launching their sovereign currency on Algorand, so we're excited to see that transpire. Uh, but there's clearly, you know, much larger work afoot there. Uh, you know, China is looking to, to build uh, or launch a digital currency, central bank-backed digital currency later this year, uh, and we're starting to see, you know, many other countries looking to do the same. So I, I think that the net is there'll be many different forms of um, fiat equivalents that exist on digital platforms. Uh, and I think Algorand has been one of the for, more forward-leaning ones uh, in terms of, um, you know, looking to make sure that there's diversity of assets there so that um, any types of securities or other things have an underlying currency that they can uh, that they can use to, to atomically swap with. Yes, yeah, so I just want to mention, to, so to, to perform DVP on the blockchain, you need actually three things, not two things. So you need the security represented on the blockchain, you need the, the cash on chain, whatever stable coin, uh, et cetera, which Algorand, as, as Steve mentioned, they're working on different fronts to bring uh, different varieties of cash on chain. And then you actually need someone that, you know, performs the chains, right? That'll send you the money, you send me the security, and someone which in, in, in capital markets is a transfer agent verifies that the transfer is actually legal because that means you have to prove that you own the security and that you can actually sell it. You don't have a lockup period, you're an affiliate, etc. And the other person needs to prove that they have the cash on chain, but also that they are suitable to receive the security because, you know, they're an accredited investor or they're not a U.S. investor buying from a European or things like that. So, so there's a combination of, of these four things, if you want, uh, the, the security on chain, the cash on chain, the smart contracts providing the, the compliance layer and the regulatory uh, framework and then the third one the atomic swap because at the end of the day once everything you say okay go then you have to swap to tokens and you have to make sure that this actually happens in an atomic way and that there is no counterparty risk uh, etc so that that technology is ready to be with you i mean uh, steve mentioned uh world chess we're actually issuing their, their securities on algorand algorand has atomic swaps they are bringing already cash and chain so we, we can do delivery versus payment on algorand already Right, all in a single single transaction. Great, awesome, thanks Carlos, thanks uh, Steve. Silvio, we're gonna go over to you. Uh, we have a question for you specifically. Can you elaborate on how Algorand co-chains differ in approach and architecture from substrate-based parachains in Polkadot? Thank you. I think that one might get a little technical, so give us at a high level a couple minutes on that. Well, we have a few minutes anyway. So, sure. So, from 30,000 feet, everything on Earth looks equal. In fact, why to stop to say all or co-chain equal in, in design? Are aren't all blockchains equal? Because, but the reason clearly is not because, you know, when uh, you, um, you look at the consensus of, of a blockchain, blockchain in principle, the definition is the same for everybody. But then you see that uh, when you receive a payment on a block, a block, a new block arrives, you have been paid, do you ship the goods? You don't. Why? Because there may be a fork later on. So what do you do? You wait one block, another block, another block, say 10 blocks, only then perhaps you ship, you ship the goods. In Algorand, there is immediate finality. Every block is guaranteed to stay on the chain forever. So when you are paid, you're really paid, you can ship the goods right away. Similarly, I foreshadow a little bit of the, the question, but thank you very much for the opportunity to double down, is that to say, yeah, the, the design of a co-chain at a very high level, everybody agrees upon, right? But assume you want to do an atomic swap that you know, somehow Carlos is very passionate about and rightfully so. So you parachute, to the hub, to the main chain, whatever that is, your asset. The other one does so. Now you want to exchange these assets. How do you do it? So it really depends on the tools you find in, in on the main chain. If you want to do a layer two smart contract, good luck. Smart contracts are slow and they are very fragile. No day goes by that you know, somebody loses millions of dollars here and there for a smart um, 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 contract gone uh, uh, rogue. So the idea that you can actually do it you know, really atomically by means of a single transaction is a really a great advantage that you find, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in certain hubs and not in others. And uh, so nobody even wants to do it. Uh, an alternative way you can find is say you do hash and lock for a transfer. Do I recommend hash and lock? Absolutely not. Here is why. What is a hash and lock? You just... Uh, 
and uh, you just uh, can uh, transfer an asset temporarily uh, somehow uh, to you because if you don't transfer the assets, uh, we say within an half an hour, I'm going to post a blocking transaction that enables me to retrieve the assets. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds simple. But is it secure? Well, let me tell you, your ability to post a block transaction only depends on my willingness not to deny launch a denial of service attack against you because if i bombard you of all kinds of junk so your buffer is full and you cannot no longer send or receive messages you cannot block the transaction so after you give me the house or the building or whatever it is i can dos you and because you, now your half hour is up i can appropriate of your assets and you have no recourse against anybody so i think that having you know the atomic swap algorithm is really a main reason to uh, being able to take the design is the same, but the hub is not the same. That it was a part of my whatever I said before, and I'm perhaps you know uh, clarifying right now. Thank you, um, and I want to thank everybody. We've run out of time, um, and I just want to point out that when my internet just crashed and I had to switch to my backup on my iPad with using the cell, uh, just to, uh, uh, just proves the point of redundancy in technology, making sure you always have a backup plan, but <laughs> I apologize for dropping off for a moment. Um, we had, a, this was uh, uh, Carlos and Steve and Sylvia, you guys were phenomenal. We have far more questions that we could, that we couldn't get to. Um, we apologize to everyone for not able to get to those questions. We will answer those in a follow-up email to everyone. So be assured that we will get those answers out to you. Um, and uh, I just want to thank our speakers and uh, for for today for giving their time and 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 all their thoughts and insights. And I also want to thank our audience and um, uh, and uh, the folks at Audible and the for putting this together. So um, thanks everyone and um, appreciate it.